is going. So welcome to this uh, reconvened meeting of Regeneration and Community on Thursday the 25th of November. Obviously, uh, we didn't get completed the last night, as you all know. Um, so we're here tonight to, to finish it off. A few housekeeping rules before I start. Um, any uh, councillors that give a declaration of interest the last night does not need to give it tonight again, uh, only for any councillors that wasn't present uh, at the meeting needs to um, give a declaration of interest. We will move uh, matters arising to after uh, correspondence uh, and we'll go through it then. And also uh, items six and seven are reports for noting only. Uh, there's going to be no discussion on them. And if anybody wants to raise any uh, problems that's on them, if they can contact uh, Kim and John uh, after the meeting the next day or whatever by phone or email. So we'll start off uh, the meeting and the first thing is apologies and I will go to the group leaders first of all and firstly to Tommy McGuire, uh, Mr. Tommy McGuire Sinn Féin. Hey, Guru Margaret. Uh, Victor, thank you, Chair. Uh, two apologies, Councillor Glenn Campbell and Collier Crystal McCaffrey. Guru Margaret, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go to the Ulster Unionist Party to Robert Irvine. I'm not sure if Robert's here tonight. I am. I'm just here, but I'm videoing. Um, no okay. apologies from the UUP, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go to Councillor Paul Robertson uh, of the DUP. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you. And then uh, Councillor Mary Garry from the SDLP. Mary mustn't be. Hello, Count, uh, please, Chair. Um, Mary's an apology, and so is Garvin uh, McPhillips for tonight. Okay, thank you. And is anybody aware of any apologies for the? Uh, the single member parties of the independence. Councillor McAleer. Very yeah. Councillor Keenan sends apologies. He's working tonight, and Councillor Coffey's at his mother in law's funeral, so he's unable to attend also. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's the apologies. As I said, uh, if there was any councillor um, who wasn't here um, at the last meeting and has a declaration of interest. Uh, he's going to give it now. Nobody indicating that is fine. Uh, we will move on then to uh, item number four, which is regeneration and planning director reports. And the first item on the agenda is to consider the report of the Director of Regeneration and Planning. Okay, thank you, Chair. So this report um, is seeking approval to pay ICBAN's annual, the, the Council's annual subscription to ICBAN uh, for the 22-23 year. So we have received correspondence from ICBAN uh, and their management board has agreed that the annual contribution should be retained at £15,000, appropriate provision uh, for which has been made in, in the estimates. Um, alongside that, we have received uh, an updated Appendix 1 in terms of ICBAN's activities uh, dated October 21. So the recommendation, Chair, is that the Council approves payment of its annual contribution of £15,000 to ICBAN, subject to confirmation from each of the other member councils that they have made similar provision. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first person up on that is Councillor Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, Kim, for your report. And I will propose to note the correspondence and to uh, pay our contribution uh, to ICBAN, which, in my view, does excellent work. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Next up, we have Stephen McCann. 
Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm not too sure if I declared an interest in this item uh, last time around. If not, just just note that, please, Chair. Apologies if I have. Okay. Okay. Um, have we a seconder, uh, Councillor Thornton? I'm quite happy to second that, Chair. Thank you. That's great. So it's been proposed and seconded. Is everybody happy with that? Councillor Baird. Yes, Chair, thank you. I'm sure that at the last meeting, it's such a long time ago, I would have declared an interest in that, so I'll not take part in this discussion or vote. Thank you. Okay. You've heard it proposed and seconded uh, that uh, it's noted or it's uh, accepted and there's no dissension, so we move on. Next, we're on to item number five, and that's the community and wellbeing reports. And 5.1 is to consider a report on the Leisure Centre Household Membership Paper J. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chair, this is a, a proposal to introduce a household membership uh, for a pilot period up until the end of 2022 for the year uh, 2022. Uh, it is really in response to a number of queries which we have received from uh, members of the public to see if, if we had something. We have a number of membership packages available for individuals of different different types and also of corporate membership. And this is the introduction of household membership. And it's introducing um, that uh, families of up to two adults and, and three children uh, from the one household uh, would be able to uh, take out membership at £50. Uh, and you will see there the various activities for which they can uh, they can avail of with that membership. Um, but it will exclude, you will see, at 2.3, a number of, uh, of uh, functions within the leisure centre also. So, so, Chair, it is for a pilot period for a year that the, the members approved the introduction of the household membership as a pilot scheme from January 22 to December 22. Thank okay. You. The first speaker up on this uh, is Councillor Siobhan Curry. Thank you. Um, and thanks, John, um, for the report. Uh, I think it's it's very welcome um, that uh, the, we're looking at this and to to make uh, leisure centres and leisure services more accessible to families. So I'm happy to uh, propose the recommendation that we do that pilot project. But I, I just um, have a question as well around um, what concessions, if any, are currently available um, to families and to people in the district for um, our leisure centres. So just I'm um, just thinking really in terms of low income families um, um, just around health and well-being. And we know the positive uh, contribution it can make and particularly people living in um, maybe like our neighbourhood renewal areas or more deprived areas, but also just out in, in, the, in the countryside. Um, what a benefit uh, the leisure services have for people in terms of health and well-being. So I'm wondering what we currently have in, ter in terms of concessionary rates. Um, and if we don't have anything, could we have a look at how we could maybe introduce some concessionary rates? maybe with funding from the likes of the PHA um, or Department of Health with some support from them um, to do it. Obviously, as I've said about health and well-being, but mental health benefits as well. And then I'm just also wondering then about community groups and organisations as well. Have we got any packages in the council for community groups and organisations? Again, I'm thinking about those kind of if you like harder to reach groups or um, maybe areas uh, in the council where we have maybe where we're showing um, kind of lower cost of uh, lower uh, mortality rates or higher health inequalities, that type of thing. I'm just wondering, have we got anything like that? If not, I'd just like to propose that we maybe just have a wee bit of a look at that and maybe bring back a report uh, as to what we could do maybe to address it because I think there is something later on coming up in reports around health in the district and the, the high 
levels of where we're kind of falling behind other districts and I think this would be an important part of addressing that. Margaret. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, yes, Councillor Corey. Um, I suppose for concessions, we have a number of packages that are available and in fact we'll be bringing a report through the next ORNC on our pricing schedule uh, in relation to our leisure provision, uh, our, annual, our, our annual prices. Um, and it's very difficult to create a package that will uh, just fit into those uh, the, the the lower end in order to 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 provide the needs needs for those in our district. Um, I suppose what I would say though, we have very very attractive packages, you know, for individuals for membership, and and they are they are very much uh, worth the value. Like you know, if if you're going to attend, and there's absolutely no doubt that the benefit that the you know, attendance at the leisure centre and taking part in physical activity brings to the health and well-being. Um, to, to create a package, though, for an individual group of people uh, for a particular part of the district would be very, very difficult. Um, so we'd, in order to be able to manage that, it would be virtually impossible to do it. In relation to the health inequalities, we are actually working uh, as one of the projects under the community plan in, in relation uh, to health inequalities as a pilot project in Oma and Air East. And out of that, I would expect that there would be uh, concessionary rates that would be made available in order for the preventative measures that we are working on in order to stop health inequalities and to increase the health and well-being of those of, of, those, of those two areas of specific areas within the district. So I would expect uh, the, for the higher health inequalities, that they would be addressed through that. But certainly, we can take we can take a look at, at concessionary rates and, and bring a, a future report through. I, I think it would be very, very difficult though, to manage uh, on behalf of of the leisure services itself. Okay. I'll be brief, Gormagat John. Thanks very much for that. Um, I suppose I'm just wondering, in terms of means testing, we could possibly look at, at means testing. Um, if I mean, this, this £50 for a family, I think, is very good if you can afford it. And £50 to some families at the end of the month won't be something that they'll be able to, to find. Um, so it's how to... Um, ensure those services are available because those are probably the people who can't find that money are probably the groups that we're wanting to target. So if we could just have a little bit of a look around how we might do that, it'd be good. Yeah, Chair, if I, if I can just come back also, as was in, in relation to those, they are of a particular interest to, to those of us, to those who can't afford that. And that, that's why I suppose the, the leisure services, there is a, a change in focus really in going out into the communities and trying to provide leisure services close to the community rather than solely in the leisure centre. To go down a road of, and, and this is without looking at it, but to go down a road of, of uh, providing uh, differential rates uh, on a means tested based basis would again be very difficult. I think we all know that the cost of providing such a service far outweighs the benefits, like you know, and, and the, the amount of administration that would be involved in, in trying to to, uh, to to manage that on a means tested basis it would, would be absolutely enormous. But we will we'll, we'll, we'll consider it and we'll take a look at it and we'll bring a report back. Okay, next we have. Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to welcome this initiative, uh, John. I think it's an excellent idea to promote health and wellbeing in our community. And I think it's a great idea. So I'm happy to second the recommendation, but I'd also like to second Siobhan's proposal to have a look at what options might be available in terms of concessions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Bernice Swift. Maragat, Kerlock, and thank you, John, for the report. And I note it all, and on uh, face value, it, it looks good. Uh, when I was perusing and looking a little bit deeper into it and noting the fixed price uh, for use of all four leisure centres uh, to be £50, I tried to think of who might just be attracted to that type of package. I, I really cannot think 
of people that might be attracted to that, you know, for use of four leisure centres, given, I suppose, our geographical uh, breakdown, uh, say, for me. And if I was a, mom, a family member of four, I don't think I'd be trotting all the way over to Oma, much as I'd love to have it on my doorstep or even uh, Lisnesky or Irvinstown. So, I'm glad while it's a pilot scheme, uh, John, just to see what the interest would be, because I suppose the unfortunate reality of everything is it's what is, is excluded in this package. You know, when we take up membership anywhere, we like the add ons and the, the perks, so to speak, the lessons and the classes and the extras like pitch hires and different activities. So um, I just not sure I hate to be negative on these matters, especially when any um, initiatives are produced, but I fully embrace everything about our health and well-being activity and I do um, um, compliment and commend the note on 1.2 where we are talking about the life-changing illnesses um, and addressing the most effective preventative measure being active and indeed addressing mental health so that's all great but of course what I really want to see is what you have just mentioned is the activity going more outreach uh, a whole project and promotion that we have talked about for many years within the council that if these services aren't accessible to all of us or those of us who live rurally well then again we are on the outside looking in so but um i'd, I'd like to see um quickly how it goes and i'd like to see a report you know as we go along and my just one quick question then john I'd like to know what the baseline is, how we are going to determine that it's successful and that it um, that we move from pilot scheme to full blown operation. I suppose that will be all down to uptake, but how much uptake are we talking about, Gurmagat? Chair, sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, I suppose just for, just for clarity, um, the scheme is that if, if you take out membership, then you can actually use it in all of our four centres, uh, whether it be from Anna Lakeland Forum or Malaysia Complex, Castle Park or, or the Bon Acre Centre. Um, and it isn't um, it isn't that you have to register with one or another in, in order to do that. Once you take out membership, you, you, are, you are able to go into each of those leisure centres. So if you and your family are down for a day down in Oma and you want to experience uh, and you're you're from the the Enniskillen area or, or the Fermanagh area, and you want to experience what Oma Leisure Complex, you actually can use your membership uh, to go into Oma Leisure Complex, and and it will be covered under the, under the fifty pound cost. How how do we measure success? Well, I suppose measurement of success is the uptake on it. We 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 are confident, and I suppose that's why it's a pilot. We are confident that that we will get substantial numbers because we have been asked uh, about this. It is in place in in a few other uh, leisure centres um, in in the region, and and we are confident that we will get substantial numbers of of families who who will take up the offer. Uh, and I suppose we will measure success in by that means and, and thereafter how many times, because we have the technology to say how many times that those families actually use that leisure centre then. With regard to what is excluded, it is it is noted at 2.3, um, you know, swimming lessons, uh, children's activities such as gymnastics and soccer, coaches and Pilates, five-a-side football, I don't think you could expect it to be to be included in a family membership, uh, and indeed the, the, the unique health suite at Odoma Leisure Complex. Actually, I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, quite surprised that, that we can offer so much actually without excluding uh, with it with excluding so little actually for for the 50 pound membership and i do i do believe it, it's actually a great deal for families okay thank you for that uh councillor deacon thank you chair and uh thank you john for your report i think this is a very exciting pilot uh and i too chair like john uh, I'm really amazed at what will be included for families, you know, uh, the household membership, two adults and up to three children under the age of 17 and then additional children can be added at a cost of £10. Now, I, I accept that £50 per month is a lot for many households, but Chair, I think uh, 
we will be informed by this year long pilot as to the success or otherwise of it. But I would be confident that it will be successful. Um, one of the um, issues that I constantly uh, raise is uh, th not only the need to provide a wide range of uh, leisure facilities, but also to ensure that our facilities are well utilised because these facilities have been provided at great expense to the ratepayer and we need to ensure that uh, as many of our citizens as possible are able to avail of these facilities. Chair, um, physical activity is now known as the new smoking. In other words, if you are physically inactive, it is as bad for your health as if you smoke tobacco. So uh, it's so important for all of us to get physically active. And I think this is an excellent pilot. Um, and uh, I, I do want to uh, support it, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we we'll now go to Councillor Tommy McGuire. I go to Margaret Victor. Thanks for that. Uh, just for, for information, uh, at the local government conference yesterday morning, I had the opportunity to raise the, the question uh, on the back of the integrated health strategy that is, is sitting in Stormont to, to suggest and request of uh, Minister Swan, uh, would he be supportive of providing uh, extra funding to councils uh, for the preventative health programmes that are being pushed out? So the question was asked directly. I can't tell you I got a, a direct answer, but uh, to, to make uh, all members aware that these issues are being raised by the NILGA at the, the highest levels to try and seek further funding so that we can implement such programmes as was indicated by Councillor Corey. Councillor Okay, thank you, Chair. I think uh, key points, Chair, of affordability have been raised by Councillor Corey, and uh, it's important that that is raised. Um, again, I want to approach this positively, um, but I think it's really important to address those key points of affordability. And obviously, one of the strategies is to bring leisure and recreation to the people in their individual district electoral areas and their communities and utilizing community facilities, etc. You know, with community well-being coordinators and sports outreach people in every community. We need that from the council as well. Um, maybe just one thing I would ask to be included in a future report is the maintenance of facilities at the leisure centres. Um, I'm hearing that the sauna equipment tends to break down a lot. I, uh, I wonder is that the case? I'm told it is. Um, not a user of that facility myself, but I've heard uh, young people say that quite often the sauna equipment is, is not functional, it's not operating, it's out of order. So just whether or not that's true, I just want a future report on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And the final speaker on this is Councillor Seamus Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, it's I welcome this, but <laughs> as all is about um, six hundred pound a year. Um, you know. Uh, any families on on uh, as average wage that's struggling uh, in this day and age, that's quite a substantial uh, block of money, and uh, fifty pound a month. That's a that's a that's a lot out of, out of families' wa wages, and I would definitely agree with Siobhan about that. Uh, try and look for some way of uh, uh, get and lower income and that uh, the benefit more because I definitely don't think there's anyone that would be on benefits or anything like that or, or very low income with uh, getting universal credit could possibly uh, afford that. Uh, I just don't think it's uh, it's possible. Uh, but just one question uh, to John um, and Probably should should know this, so uh, uh, apologies. Uh, people with disabilities or health issues or mental health issues, we all know, uh, 
uh, greatly benefit from from exercise. Uh, what what does the council do in in around uh, people uh, like that? Uh, I, I believe there was a scheme wanting, but I think it was very specific uh, ailments that it was uh, with. But uh, around mental health disabilities and just general health issues like heart or uh, diabetes or anything like that. Yes, Chair. We we have we have a number of schemes, um, such as the Power Scheme, the Move More Scheme, for for people with disability. Absolutely excellent schemes schemes where where they there are referrals, um, to ourselves uh, from health professionals, uh, and we take them through a, a ten week intense program, uh, free of charge, and then give them membership for a period of time at our leisure centres. Uh, so that they can use the facilities and, and, and it's they're absolutely excellent programs. In fact, I, I spent a morning last week out with the Move More uh, program and it was absolutely enlightening. Um, and in fact, I must just bring a report through uh, to members just for information purposes on it. Uh, it, it it's really, really do your heart good, like, you know, to, to actually be out there and see the benefits that such programs actually bring to people. Now, they, these are these are people that are recovering from cancer. Uh, and we, we, it's a very detailed program where they're taking on activities for two days per week, uh, and it's not only it's not only the health benefits of the physical activity, but it's also the whole social interaction that they have. So there are there are numerous programs that that we have within our, our leisure services, and um, that provide that provide for those, and it is something. Uh, that we are are talking about increasingly uh, about how we how we get how we try to reach those people that maybe not necessarily inherently use our leisure centres. Yes, we 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 see our leisure centres, you know, our fitness suites especially and our swimming pools for those who are who are fit and those who want to get fit and who are interested in fitness. But increasingly, there is a need to try and attract those, like you say, uh, Councillor Green, with disabilities and whatever. And and there are. You know, we are looking at that in detail as to how we can how we can increase uptake uh, of 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 those people. But there are quite a number of very very brilliant programs which we run, which attract those people. Thank you for that, John. Um, okay, you've heard the the recommendations first of all proposed and seconded. Uh, is everybody happy with those? Thank you. And then you've also heard. Uh, Councillor Curry's proposal, seconded by Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, uh, that John brings back uh, a detailed report, uh, maybe to our next meeting, uh, to give more information on. It probably won't be the next meeting. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. This is the reconvene meeting, uh, and we're 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 halfway to there already. So, but that John will bring back a report. Um, at its earliest convenience. Rephrase that. Everybody happy with that? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item 5.2, which is to consider the report on the event strategy working group paper K. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it, it's the report is to provide members with uh, an update on the event strategy uh, working group meeting, which was held on, on the 1st of November. Um, and also to seek approval for sponsorship uh, awards uh, to two third party organized uh, events. There, there, effectively, there, there, there were three main items which were discussed at the event strategy working group. One is in relation to the OMA Winter Wonderland. Uh, it's an NSG, and I know it has been receiving an awful lot of uh, publicity in, in, in the run up to Christmas. Um, and in fact, just listening to the radio this morning, it, 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 there was an article on, on Radio Ulster in relation to it. Um, uh, so previously, members had approved uh, four thousand pounds of of sponsorship uh, to the Winter Wonderland. Uh, the program since that has changed and has changed quite significantly, uh, and it has actually grown in in terms of of content and um, and the expected numbers. Um, and uh, St Denda's GA, who are, who are running the event, um, they provided a new application. Uh, for the program, and it was assessed by officers, and uh, there is a pro there is a recommendation um, that uh, we increase that uh, sponsorship to nine thousand pounds. Um, similarly, the the share um, discovery centre in in Lisnesky, uh, have an indoor ice rink, and now they had submitted an application uh, for the for the ice rink, 
um, and it was received prior to the to the event commencing. Um, um, but they have they have actually proceeded at risk, um, and uh, you know we we are we are uh, recommending that we actually support that uh, dice dice rink experience also, um, and also in relation to the two of them, the Winter Wonderland and the Ice Rink, uh, we um, have been in contact with uh, Tourism NI, and uh, have received funding in order to increase connectivity. Uh, to uh, both of those events, uh, both from from Lisnesky out to out to the Share Centre and uh, from Oma Town Centre uh, to uh, the St Enda's GA, uh, and uh, we uh, have a service level agreement uh, to the value of ten thousand uh, pounds from Tourism NA for that experience connectivity. Um, so, Chair, there there is uh, the the draft minutes are are included uh, as an appendix, and the recommendation is that the council notes the draft minutes and and the recommendations of the event strategy working group uh, that approves the recommendation that St Enda's GA receives sponsorship of up to nine thousand pounds, and notes that the Share Discovery Centre has submitted an application prior to the event commencing, and that this application will be considered as part of the third sponsorship call. And also notes the support through Tourism NI for the service level agreement to improve the connectivity to the Winter Wonderland experience and the, the Share and ACE experience. Okay, thank you for that. The first up is Councillor Josephine Deacon. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, John, for your report. At the outset, I want to commend the Event Strategy Working Group uh, for their hard work. Uh, in providing our district area with um, so many wonderful events, which really uh, um, brighten up what has been a very dark period of the COVID pandemic. I also want to acknowledge the work of the council staff uh, liaising with uh, community groups and seeking uh, to provide whatever support is necessary. Um, Chair, on Sunday past, I was driving past uh, St Enda's and saw this amazing wheel which was blazing out light and I thought wow how wonderful um, and I want to commend Oma St Enda's on their initiative the winter wonderland and I think that it will be just that a winter wonderland so many congratulations to them I absolutely agree that we can recategorize this as a large event and I have no doubt that it will attract many visitors uh, from near and far. Similarly, the Share Discovery Centre, the indoor ice rink, I mean, that has traditionally been associated with Christmas events. And I think it will all add to the general festive uh, uh, activities associated with Christmas. So I think these are wonderful initiatives. I also uh, am pleased that Tourism NI have uh, entered into the service level agreement with the council in terms of improving access and connectivity so that people can access these wonderful events uh, easily and without causing too much traffic congestion. So I want to uh, propose the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deacon. And next, uh, we will go to Councillor Barry McElduff. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'm happy to second the recommendations, uh, Chair, in terms of their adoption. And uh, I want to commend in particular the imagination, the ambition and scale of the efforts uh, out at the Winter Wonderland, out at O'Neill's uh, Healy Park, and uh, to commend Omas and Dendas for their investment. It is creating a great buzz of excitement. And I know that they're, they're exploring all the time ways and means of enhancing uh, the town centre uh, economy as well through various types of connectivity and promotions. And again, to thank the council officers for their active engagement, you know, and for their, their listening approach and, and helpful approach. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Councillor Bernice Swift. 
Sarah Magat, Kahirlock, and Josephine, and um, Barry has just answered uh, the, one of the questions I had for John because I did see a photograph in one of this week's papers about the winter wonderland at uh, Healy Park with the big wheel, and I thought, oh, I hope that that's not fake news, and when I would land down there, that there wouldn't be a big wheel for me to get on and have some great fun. But it looks ever so special. It's a uh, uh, certainly very merry looking for Christmas and totally, totally um, just embracing the whole spirit after the whole horrible year that has been a long time with this whole lockdown and everything else. And it is highly commendable, all of the excitement that has been planned again for this year. And I too want to be uh, um, sharing the great commendation and applause to all the officers who and indeed the event strategy working group with the ideas and uh, it's beautiful to see the little boat lit up uh, on our lake and the swan also already and the lights is just marvelous so very well done to everyone and i'm just so looking forward to santi coming now ho 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 it's definitely not going to you councillor swift but anyway uh next up we have councillor Anne marie fitzgerald Yes, Chair, sorry, I wasn't bothered there. No, I don't want to go into anything in depth, but just congratulate you, everybody involved. And as the previous councillors have stated, the big wheel is just amazing. I've seen some great social media posts from other parts of the town and this huge, wonderful, big shed and wheel. And it's like something you'd see on the Virtue Road about Wonderland. And great uh, initiative by um, Omis and Endless. Um, I know a couple of vendors who's going there. And now they've seen the wheel, they can't wait to get reared up and going. And so we just encourage everybody to go. And I know Councillor McIndoff had been working with us with the group as well. So congratulations to St. Andrews and the worst of all, very much success. And as with um, the Share Centre as well, there years ago. So two great things for people to visitors to come to our town in the wintertime. So well done, all. Thank you, uh, Councillor Matthew Bell. Um, I, I don't take any pleasure taking away from the positivity, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask, if I didn't ask questions. Um, I I got I was in contact with um a few they were mothers, um and they they were saying that they weren't um that they that they were considering not going to the Oma Winterland um event due to its location, um in a GA club. So I was just wondering, chair, um have or will any steps be taken to ensure everyone will feel welcome, um at the event? Thank you. Yeah, chair. Um, yes, I, I think I think one of one of the things that you know, is one of, one of our discussions with with Omas and Endos, like you know, is the inclusivity, and it's very much a very inclusive uh, activity for Christmas, and I think it's been very much being promoted as that. Um, so it is. I think all the literature that I have seen is is very welcoming to everyone, and it, it's not seen as one side or the other side it is very much a, an activity and, a, and a, for for all sides of the community to come and I, I think the spectacular element of it is the big wheel and i think it will attract all sides of of the community and i've, I've absolutely no doubt that it will be a massive success thank you john okay uh you've heard uh it proposed and seconded that we accept the rec recommendations uh, everybody happy with that Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to item 5.3, which is to consider the report on the Arts and Heritage Pricing 22-23 Paper L. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, this is a, an annual report on, on our pricing schedule, and I, I indicated earlier that we'll be bringing one through in relation to our leisure services uh, at next month's uh, RNC meeting. Uh, this is in relation to our cultural and heritage facilities. Uh, you will see at two point one of the report that the you know the various facilities that are included. Uh, it's proposed that uh, Ardoan and the Stuhl Arts Centre that uh, to hold the prices at the twenty one twenty two levels, uh, and the same for Fermanagh County Museum. The Marble Arch Caves has been assessed, and, and we have done a, a study in relation to similar events or similar attractions. Um, and 
uh, we we actually have increased the, the pricing uh, in line with the, the industry benchmarking exercise, which which we have under, undertaken in order to bring us up up to the same level. Uh, the, the the visitors which which come to the Marble Arch are, are largely from from outside, and it is it is a major international tourist uh, place now for for people to come, and it is one of our primary attractions, the, the Marble Arch, um, and it is it is only. Uh, Fair, I suppose that we we are on the same level as other uh, similar attractions in, in in the region, and therefore the the pricing schedule is is included in Appendix Three for for the Marble Arch Caves. All other prices in relation um, to our cultural and heritage facilities uh, remain the same, with with the exclusion of of the Marble Arch. So, therefore, Chair. It is uh, recommended that the council approves the, the pricing recommend or the pricing for the Ardoan Theatre, the Stool Arts Centre, the Marble Arch Caves, and the Fermanagh County Museum. Um, and there are a number of uh, uh, things that that managers themselves have have discretion or we're proposing continue to have discretion in relation to pricing such as large group tours and, and things like that in order to attract those uh, from the large from the large companies so it continues to get it's recommended that the, the council continues to give authority to the venue managers to set prices for new experience and products and the negotiated discounted admissions to and to make discounted and offers available when appropriate and uh, the continuation of the admission split between Fermana County Museum and the Inniskillens Museum at the 8020 split uh, when then the Skillings Museum is open and approves the, the use of charges to the media and production companies. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, yes, thank you, John, for this report. Um, it's really, really pleasing to see that um, TripAdvisor, the, those two attractions mentioned, TripAdvisor rates and 4.5 star ratings. So, I mean, that's the success of those. Um, venues that we have in our district um, and I think we shouldn't undervalue them um, I know best efforts are made to keep them affordable for people to visit but I think um, I would be happy to recommend the report thank you chair you're you're proposing the recommendations councillor Armstrong thank you uh, councillor Hart Thornton hey thank you chair yes I'm quite happy to second them although there is a uh, a wee issue that I wanted, I've been in conversation with John about the, the director, and uh, I'd ask and propose that he would come back to a committee and advise on the progress towards the William Scott Archive, which we accepted a responsibility for or whatever, uh, just before the COVID lockdown. So whilst I've been satisfied myself, there has been progress, I would propose that he more or less say, uh, provide some information back to committee in the future. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, it's an interesting report and uh, I welcome the fact that there's no increases for the Fermanagh County Museum and the Street Arts Centre. And I was just going to query in terms of the, the yard one because I didn't see a comparison from the previous year, but glad that the, the director has assured us there's no rise there. It's interesting to note as well in terms of the type of performance or whether uh, artists have a set list or not, or indeed whether they play classical music or not, the, the percentage charge on tickets actually varies, which is which is again an interesting one. I have a question and, and I'm disappointed to see that the Marble Arch has decided to raise the, the prices, I suppose, being particularly mindful of the financial difficulties a lot of individuals and a lot of families are facing at present. But I was wondering, do we have any information on why uh, at the bottom of the first table there on Appendix 3, there's no increase for pre and primary school children, there's no increase for university level children, there's no increase for teacher education, but there is an increase for secondary education students. And I'm just wondering why, out of all the, the students that are there, why, why are they the ones that are getting hit with the, the price hike? Um, and I like I know I would be mindful that we shouldn't be increasing, but I would like to see that if we're not increasing the price for any other uh, educational students or pupils, that we shouldn't be increasing it for the the secondary pupils either. So I would be proposing that if we are adopting 
the the new pricing schedule that we don't increase the, the secondary education price we keep it as is in future chair just just in, re in relation to that like i said we we have done a, a price comparison with other similar facilities and, and the, the the response and, and the the, the rates that are set are in line with, with that. And that is why secondary education has actually gone up. The level of involvement um, from our, our tutors uh, that are involved in uh, secondary education is actually a lot greater than it would be in primary education or indeed with, with university students. University, university uh, students normally have their lecturer there uh, and, and various, you know, to explain a lot of the various aspects and our interaction with secondary school students is actually a lot greater than it is with primary kids or with secondary schools. And that's that's the sole reason why it is slightly and it is only very, very slightly different. Do you, uh, if, given what you've just said then, can I query why the university students are being charged more than the secondary education students then if the secondary education students receive uh, more hands-on approach from from our staff then surely it would stand the reason that they would be charged more and the university students would be charged less it's it, it, it's all related to, to supply and demand also there are a number of factors which go into the which go into the pricing um with with uh, you know with the with the supply there's a, there's a lot greater demand uh, and a smaller number of uh, university students that would come and use our facilities in in, in the marble arch and um, so and that's the reason why you know the increase is or the, the the rate per person is actually is actually a lot greater for for university students okay we have had the initial uh, recommendations proposed and seconded um is everybody happy enough with that um we had a proposal uh, by Councillor Burton that we uh, revisit the... Yeah, Chair, Chair, just in relation to that, there will be a report coming through in, in December in relation to the William Scott Ar Archive also. Okay. Um, are you happy enough with that, Councillor Thornton, that, that, uh, uh, that we don't need to go through the proposal on that? I'm very happy with that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And we had a proposal from Councillor McAleer. Uh, can you just uh, fair, uh, clarify that proposal again, Councillor McAleer, please? Yes, Chair. So, um, first of all, I'd like to just dissent from the original uh, proposal to adopt the, the report as advice. But my proposal was that rather than increase the, each of the, the prices for the secondary level students, by I think it was 50 pence each increase, I would propose that we actually keep it at the, the current year's level. Thank you. Okay. Have we a seconder for that? Okay, sorry, Councillor McAleer, there's no seconder coming in on that. Uh, so, sorry, Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, yes, I do. I, I do agree. I don't think there should be that differential. And we all know the constraints uh, on student finances. So I would second Councillor McAleer's proposal there, Chair. Thank you. OK. Chair, Chair the, the two proposals are directly opposite to each other. And, and for I don't think we can, we can go down that line. The original proposal has already been been proposed and seconded. Yeah. Well, I think I've already done. I've confirmed that the original. Uh, everybody agreed with the original proposal. Um, so, if that's the case. Uh, Councillor McAleer, your proposal, sorry, is, is in direct conflict with the original proposal. So I think we have to knock that on the head. Councillor Tommy McGuire. Uh, I go to Margaret. Uh, Victor, I was just coming in on this issue. Uh, we already had it proposed and agreed with the uh, uh, single objection of, of Councillor McAleer. So I, I think it's uh, 
already done and dusted. You know, that'll be my opinion. Okay, Emma, to let you in again. I don't want this going to a big debate. No, it's just going to clarify what Councillor Maguire said there that you'd, you'd stated there that it went through on a post, but just to note that I, I was dissenting and I'm dissenting from it then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will move on to item 5.4, and that is to consider a report on the Dark Skies accreditation uh, paper M. Thank you, Chair. Chair, members received a very, very interesting presentation from Brian Epsey uh, of Dark Skies Ireland um, in September. Um, and it, it was really, uh, really highlighted, you know, where the the benefits of, of Dark Skies accreditation and, and where they're actually working very well. Um, and we, we've been looking at this and we actually, there was work actually done in the council in 2016, 2017 in, in relation to Dark Skies. And there was, you know, just to examine the feasibility of applying for uh, Dark Skies accreditation uh, for areas of, of the Geopark. Um, and, it, you know, that, that work was inconclusive in a sense. Uh, because it challenged some of the late domes in, in the bleak Derragonley uh, garrison area. But it is something I think following the presentation uh, from Professor Epsey that we should revisit again. Um, the benefits of, of having dark skies, uh, both from an environmental point of view, but uh, and also from a tourism point of view for people coming to experience the dark skies uh, is, is, is absolutely fantastic. And, and therefore it is proposed that um, we would uh, undertake research in, in collaboration with the dark, International Dark Sky Places to identify two suitable sites within the district uh, with a future report to be brought to committee to, to pursue accreditation um, for, for, the, for those identified sites. And it may be that, you know, that one being in, in the Fermanagh site of the district and, and the other being in, in the Fermanagh site and the Sparren site of the district. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, first up on that is Councillor McAleer. Hey, Chair, and thanks, John, for the report. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to propose noting and, and progression of this report. I think it would be great to see this. And, and I notes, particularly, I suppose, in my end, the, the Mediterranean area, the, the Sparrens, we already have a fantastic site in our neighbouring uh, district council in Mid Ulster over at Dava. And I think that if we proceed in the, in the Sparrens area, it's something that would complement and work very well with that existing site. Uh, it would prove uh, mutually beneficial and I suppose the, the added value of proximity and scale would have to be taken into consideration. It's worth noting that only three counties at present have accredited dark skies areas, areas Kerry, Mayo and Davan County Tyrone. And uh, as noted, and, and John, you referred to this, the the multiple uh, benefits of this uh, under 5.5 and the, the report there, the environmental, economic and social uh, positives are all something that we should be very happy and proud to progress, as is noted at the bottom of page two. It works well with our sustainable development uh, proposals. So the fact that it uh, takes approximately three years to progress the accreditation I think we should progress this as, as fast as we can. So I'm happy to propose that and uh, get the ball rolling on it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Councillor Feely. Thank, thank you, Chair. And yes, it's a, it's a topic that I did great interest as well. I think not more than looking up at the, at the sky, the dark sky at night, the stars, but then the winter time is very fascinating. But it's just about with, with the dreams of our geo park, like I, I think we would. We, you know, it says the late dome from the late Derrigan Lee Garrison Lake, but uh, I think we would have good spots in, in the geo park, and it would be great to, to have a place uh, for a dark sky, like this, like um, the beside me, the, 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 up the, it's called Little Dog and Big Dog, you know, it's, it's away from, there's no lake close to the tall, I know, but not the far there, up at the forest drives there, it does be bright up there with the lights coming up, but there is great areas that we would have for, you know, even up around bars of bowl up there where, um, and through there, I see other members would have seen it too. There's a, a fellow from up there, Tom Gray, had great pictures up on Facebook there of the of the Northern Lake. You know, it was absolutely beautiful lake. So I would um just think that we'd be great to get one in, in some place in the Geo Park, you know. And I just I'm second the proposal. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Dehan. 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to thank uh, John for his uh, report. Um, I think it's really appropriate that we should uh, explore to accredited uh, dark sky parks in our district. I think as a large rural council area, uh, many, uh, many areas are remote and would be well suited to the provision of uh, a dark skies park. Um, I think people have always been fascinated uh, by uh, the night sky, even going back to the times of Sir Patrick Moore when he presented the sky at night on the BBC. And uh, people are fascinated by it. And more recently, there has been an increased interest in astronomy with um, Professor Brian uh, Cox's um, expositions on the universe. And for anyone who hasn't viewed that series, I would I would commend it to you. I think there's much to be learnt from just um, exploring our our galaxy and the wider universe, and it will help us to understand how unique the planet Earth is, because in our exploration so far, we have not uh, uh, encountered any uh, planet uh, so extraordinary as Earth, and I think that. It behoves us all to protect our planet and certainly with the challenges, the environmental challenges that we face, I think increased knowledge of our galaxy and universe will encourage people to be more proactive in terms of protecting our planet. So thank you, Chair, for that. I want to support the recommendation. OK, next up we have Councillor Bernice Swift. Viramagat Kahirluk and fully supporting this recommendation of which I will want to see proceeding with immediacy. And I fully embrace and have been talking about this for a long time. I think you mentioned 2016, John. Um, so, and the workshop that we attended was wholly inspiring again. Uh, and I really look forward to everything being fully implemented into our FODC area um, that will meet with the dark skies uh, criteria. Again, uh, I feel very strongly, you've outlined it, John, about the environmental enhancement that it will do, how it, all of the dark skies conception will embrace our biodiversity as well. We learned everything about all of that, uh, those important strategies and the complexities within the workshop. And I would like to think that us moving forward uh, to reach accreditation will also create the awareness and highlight the importance against light pollution. And it's something that I've been fighting against for uh, quite a number of years. I brought it up more recently at our rec recent road service meeting where I am acutely aware of going into some of our more rural areas where they're lit up now, much like Times Square. And that certainly doesn't help a dark sky impact. And I would like to see our rural tourism, particularly given the recent evidence of the sighting of the Aurora Borealis, clearly observed in the night skies over Ballon Temple, uh, Belcou, and the Bow area. So I feel strongly again that our beautiful skies should be kept above us, naturally dark for our present people to thoroughly enjoy and for future generations to enjoy the beauty of the twinkling stars, along with, as Josephine has mentioned about other planets in our solar system, the Milky Way, and even the meteor showers that has been experienced over the past number of years with the naked eye. We don't necessarily need the um, big uh, uh, telescopes and all of that to see it. Uh, so how marvelous to be able to see with the naked eye. And uh, John, you mentioned Derragonly as being one of the domes. Well, yeah, there's a lot of silverware shining in Derragonly at the minute, but that's nothing to do with the, the, the twinkling of the stars. It's all to do with the New York Gold Cup. But uh, let that shine too for many more years. But uh, fully embrace all of this. And thank you for organizing the workshop, which was extremely informative. And I look forward to our area being so enhanced with the whole Dark Skies project. Gurmagat. Councillor Green. Yeah, uh, I always seem to be the one that puts a, a fly announcement, but um, 
I have to say I'm extremely disappointed. And uh, I think uh, yourself, Victor, as a member of uh, the Clovis Bear, uh, uh, Bally Bay a partner, Ernie's partnership, will know what I'm talking about here. For a number of years, we have talked about the dark skies in relation to uh, Slave Bay. We did, uh, uh, in collaboration with the council, uh, who uh, uh, money into a, a, a master plan, a Slave Bay master plan with the Monaghan Council, uh, which one of its uh, main parts was the Dark Skies uh, initiative. Um, we have now a Slave Bay working group uh, that incorporates Mid Ulster uh, Council, uh, Monon Council, and uh, from Ananoma District Council. And again, that is, that's something that has been talked about. Uh, I might say a number uh, that there is always council officers uh, at these group, uh, meetings. And um, I'm extremely disappointed that we have been just completely uh, uh, banished from, from this. I did mention it uh, at that uh, work or uh, that presentation uh, about the dark skies, but again, it seems to have been ignored. Just uh, like the Sleeve Bay area has always been ignored, uh, I uh, fe don't know when the last time the council ever invested anything in the Sleeve Bay area, uh, but we have this working group now up with the three councils. But even with that, I'm extremely disappointed that uh, we haven't even been mentioned in this while we have been working on this for years. It almost seems as if, you know, we don't count. Uh, so uh, uh, could John just uh, respond on that? And uh, just to, to ask, uh, when the, the council officers come back from these work, from these uh, uh, Clonus Air and East and Slave Bay working groups and that, do they ever mention about anything that we have actually been talking about and uh, planning uh, over the years? Chair, Chair, just just in relation to the dark skies, uh, I suppose the recommendation is that we work with international dark sky places to identify two suitable two suitable sites. Can I assure Councillor Green that the Sleeve Bay area will be considered? In fact, the full district will be considered as part of the research that we're going into. Um, and it it isn't it actually isn't a very easy thing to get accreditation. Um, you would be actually very surprised. Uh, as the difficulty there, there are 10 aspects which are highlighted in, in the International Dark Skies documentation, to which must be considered. And, and not just getting accreditation, but maintaining accreditation as a dark sky. It, it is, it's quite a feat. Um, and it isn't, you, you know, one may look up at the sky when you're in a rural location and not see any sign of any artificial light at all. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a dark sky accreditation. What, what I will say to Councillor Green is that the Sleeve Bay area will certainly be considered, as will all other areas within our district, to identify the two most suitable locations. And that will be working in partnership with those consultants that are best placed in order to make um, in order to make a call as to as to whether we would be likely to achieve accreditation. Okay, thank you for that, John. Next up we have Councillor Sean Clark. Mr. Clark. Are you there, Sean? We'll come back to you, Sean. Uh, next, we have Councillor Howard Thornton. Hey, thank you, Chair. Just, just looking at this, and uh, on paragraph 2.2, .2, it talks about a designation the east of the district in the Sparrows and close to the already dark skies park at Dava. I'm unclear as to you know what it's saying there because surely if we have one already at Dava, well then we shouldn't be sort of highlighting that in two point two that you know the best possibility is very close and probably would as a tourism venue anyhow would be actually starting to conflict and compete with the Davos site. Just like Joel to make a comment on it, please. Yeah, 
Chair, just in just in the same in the same response as uh, as to Councillor Green, we will be entering into this with a totally open book as to where the best locations for the dark sky accreditation sites are. Um, uh, yes, it, it says the possible dark, and it may well be that you know a very good location is at Dava or beside you know close to to Mid Ulster area Dava Forest. Um, but that might not necessarily be where we would decide to have a dark sky location in our, for ourselves within our district. So I can assure members that this is a total open and transparent process that we will be working with those people who are best to have the best knowledge as to, to which locations are the best uh, in order to achieve accreditation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we go back to Sean Clark, if he's here? Chair, can you hear me now? I can hear you loud and clear, Sean. Well, I might be slightly not as enthusiastic because, of, you know, for example, my understanding that is land, property owners would have to put off lights and all the rest of it. For example, in the area, we have a, a sports club which regularly uses floodlights. That surely wouldn't be allowed. And there's several other farmers and all, who have big lights. Those would have to be taken down or certainly switched off, as far as I understand. So I'm... Um, not totally against it, but I'm, I'm, I just think there's big problems with it. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor, sorry, you want to answer yeah, this? No, I, I think Councillor Clark highlights a very important thing. And what I was saying, it is not easy to achieve this. You know, um, if, if we want artificial lighting from, from various sports grounds or whatever, yes, there are mechanisms by which we can get around that in shielding and, and various things like that. All of that has to be taken into consideration. The, 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 the documentation on the guidance in relation to dark skies is very, very, very detailed in relation to the natural light, in relation to artificial light, and in relation to how you maintain it ongoing, uh, and the, the management and the maintenance plan that you must, must put in place. And this isn't just something that you decide that I have a dark skies location. It does require, in the same way as our geo park, it does require full-time maintenance in order to make sure that it, that it is maintained. But it, it is a good point made by, by, by Councillor Clark. The, those are all of the of, of the considerations which which must be taken in, in deciding which are, what are our best locations. Councillor Corey. Um, just, I, I think this is exciting. Um, to see in the outcome of it but just a question really around and it, it probably comes into more of the the kind of the planning or the the co-design cool element of it just making sure that um what we are looking at is kind of future proofed as well you know if we do identify two sites that um through maybe some other departments way of working that that doesn't kind of uh, banjacks the whole thing maybe I'm thinking particularly, Chair, of um, Department for Infrastructure and their street lighting. And we know, and we've talked a bit here um, in, in previous meetings around different light temperatures and different um, types of street lighting that can throw off more of a, a glare or um, create these light domes that are referenced in the report. So I wonder, could we just, uh, and I'd like to propose maybe that we do, um, contact the Department for Infrastructure just to ask about their current, um, because they are kind of changing the lighting that they're rolling out across the district. Are they doing that? Uh, are they shielding the street lights? Because if you put the shields on, that can affect how much then is through up into the air. It's just with a thought of what we're trying to design here and what we're trying to achieve for the district isn't kind of ruined by um, another department may be throwing in some lights without actually realising what we're doing. So it's to create that awareness with the department, but also to ask them, do they have any design considerations in place when they're putting in the street lighting or what are they putting in at present? And just to bear that in mind. Okay. Okay, it's been proposed and seconded. Uh, as we write to the VFA to... Um, basically ask them what their plans are uh, before I move to the next speaker. Is everybody happy with that proposal? Okay. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Deanna Armstrong. 
the chair and yet what councillor curry says is yes actually a bit of horizon scanning there so that is important in the context we're working in um and i would be supportive of that um in 2012 i think it was the observatory came down and investigated the dark skies concept in the letter area down near cash so i think you know it's it's a really dispersed area um i think that's where we're going to find the census space and place where these um, areas are where people can see the dark skies above where there is minimum light uh, pollution coming from the the area but i think that's a really exciting concept and it'll really add to the credentials for our sustainable tourism in the district so thank you for the report john i'm sorry i did miss the workshop and I, i'm sure it's fascinating i'd love to see how the process rolls through thank you okay thank you um councillor green your your hand still up um i'll bring in councillor coyle first because he was next or is your hand up by mistake or do you want to come in again um, I'd rather you didn't, but uh, we'll go to we'll go to Councillor Coyle. Uh, I think Councillor Green does want a question, uh, Chair. Just, but no. Um, last night uh, I was out uh, and I was just looking up at the plow and the cluster uh, of stars, and it, they were lovely, like at the moonlight. Um, you know, this past week or so uh, has been brilliant, and. Uh, I'll say that letter, well, it's near Mulek Lake, so we've got plenty of dark skies round here. So um, hopefully that it'll, it might be, and it's in the Geo Park, like Castle Colwell and everything else, but I'm fully supportive of this. Uh, oh. And I'd like to learn more and uh, for our residents to learn more about the, you know, the, uh, all the different types of uh, constellations that's in the sky. Thank you. Okay. And will Councillor Green wants to come in with a follow up question? Last speaker. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, no, just in relation to what John has been saying there, that the whole area uh, is included. Well, down at the bottom of the report, number seven, it says district areas affected. And it says air north, air west, and mid Tyrone. So that's clearly the uh, Kolka and uh, the Sparrows has talked about there. You know, uh, uh, let's get real here. Uh, uh, um, Slee Bay uh, was being completely uh, ignored. It wasn't even in the thinking. It's, it's clear in number seven. Can John comment on why that, that's in if the whole area is included? Sure. It, it, I, I note it has been, it says likely to be in in air north, air and west, mid drone, and I suppose what we should have said in there, all areas within within the district. Um, and uh, apologies, that is, and I can assure Councillor Green, and I can't see it any stronger than that, that the whole district will be considered as an area for dark skies or a, a, to potential two dark sky areas within the district. And I can give can them. Can we amend that the number seven? I can amend number seven. Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we'll just go back to the original proposal uh, on the recommendations, and that was proposed in second. Is everybody happy with that? Just section seven, yeah. With the amendment, yeah, to section seven. Okay. We're now moving on to uh, the reports for information only, as stated at the start of the meeting. These are for information. If you have any questions that arises from the reports, uh, please refer them to the relevant officers in the next couple of days. So item 6.1 is to note update report on terrorism and economic recovery plan. And do you want to say anything, Kim? No, Chair, just the report is, is as tabled and it's an update uh, for members' information in respect of progress uh, on the Tourism and Economic Recovery Plan and the recommendation is to note. Okay. Mr. Armstrong? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I propose to note, but I just also wanted to thank the, the team for the uh, Enterprise Week. There was uh, a number of online events there. They were all uh, 
very worthwhile and I think the attendance is very good and the feedback seemed to be very positive. So well done for, for that work. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Thank you very much, Carly. Just to second the recommendation. Okay, thank congratulate you. The, the work that went into the report. It was very in depth. Okay, you've heard it proposed and seconded that we note uh, item 6.1. Everybody happy with that? We move on to 6.2, and that is to note the report of the Director of Regeneration and Planning, Paper O. Thank you, Chair. So again, this is, is for noting. It's an update on an acceptance of a letter of offer, a letter of variance, an update on an addendum to a business case, and an update on uh, the Department for Economy's Petroleum Licensing Policy Research. And the recommendations are to note the updates provided. Okay. Councillor McAleer. Sorry, Chair, just in relation to 6.1, I, I think I had declared an interest at the previous meeting, but just to record that um, as a member of both the Fermanagh Lakeland Trust, or, which is on Appendix 1 and the at Southwest College, which is in Appendix 2, 3 and 4, uh, just to declare an interest in that. In relation to the, the current paper that we're looking at, um, on the it's item 2.4 in the update. Uh, uh, sorry, Emmett, I said no discussion on it. If you have a query, please come back to Kim uh, in the next day or so or whatever. All I'm looking for here is just a proposal Chair, and seconder to to note the car to note the paper tonight. Chair, given the fact that this no, um, it, please, I'm not, please don't do this on me. We need to chase up. Not tonight. When are we no, to come back this? into the come back to the officer tomorrow, and the officer will explain everything to you. So, can I have a proposer and seconder? to note uh, item 6.2. Proposed by Councillor Thornton, have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Paul Robinson. Does everybody agree? Okay. We will move on to uh, item 7. And again, it's another report for noting, and it's to note the report on the decade of Centenary's uh, Paper P. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it is just to, to note the, the minutes and the recommendations of the Decade of, of Commemorations Working Group, which was held on the 18th of October, and there are three appendixes associated with the report. Okay, can I have a proposer to note that report? Don't everybody speak at once. Councillor Thornton and Councillor Matthew Bell. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to item 8, and 8.1 is to consider correspondence dated the 25th of October 21 from the Department of Health regarding recruitment and retention of healthcare staff. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this is in, in relation um, to a query uh, from members to sought assurance of the appropriate efforts were made to secure full future funding for the training of specialist and, and general practice nurses. Um, and you will see in that eight point one the response from the minister, um, in where he outlines uh, the the employment of general practice nurses and the, the provision of training to those, uh, the recruiting and training for advanced nurse practitioners, um, and um, for their for their role to undertake the the assessment of patients, uh, and to formulate diagnosis and negotiate a management plan for them. And, and over 30 uh, advanced nurse practitioners have been employed. Um, and he does state, you will see in the final paragraph, that it's not possible to make commitments with regard to, to future funding, but that the, his department is, is keen to employ as many nurse practitioners and general practice nurses as possible. Okay, thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, as, uh, I've been contacted, I suppose, in relation to the subject, and I'd raised it, and, and I'm glad that we've got at least the response, although it, it's not necessarily a response I would have been hoping for, but the fact that there is a commitment subject to available funding is, I kind of says it all. I would propose that we actually write back to the Minister to find out how many of those uh, 30 advanced nurse practitioners since 2018 have been employed or placed uh, in this particular district. Um, and I would also query with him and, and maybe extend this out to the, the Western Trust and maybe the, the Public Health Agency as well, because I'm aware of at least uh, two cases 
where the funding was made available, but unfortunately then the commitment in terms of the supporting role within for, to allow the to allow the students a trainee role and to provide the clinical supervision uh, was actually withdrawn midway through the course. So the first year of the course was successfully completed. There was funding made available for the second year of the course, but unfortunately, due to these other circumstances, the students in question were not able to complete the course, meaning that there was a waste there of potentially tens of thousands of pounds because uh, money that was committed to the universe, universities to complete this course, the students weren't able to actually complete and gain their full qualification. So I would propose that we write through right back to the minister as, as head of the department and also to the Western Trust and to the public health agency, just to see if we can get clarification on that, to see if those uh, matters can be rectified or revisited and to get some sort of assurance that uh, staff members who commit and are offered the potential to do this staff improvement and not only that, but to to fill quite serious gaps within the area to support their staff and to support patients that they're actually seen through to the end and that they're given the qualification at the end of it and they're given the chance to achieve that qualification. So I'd like to make that as a proposal, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to propose the noting of the letter as well? Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Deacon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, at the outset, Chair, I would like to uh, express my admiration for Minister Swan and uh, all the um, hard work that he has put in over the last almost two years in trying to uh, protect this community uh, from the worst excesses of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. However, having said that, Chair, and that uh, is uh, expressed in a most sincere way, I have to say that I am disappointed at this response. Um, the Council wrote to him on the 9th of July, and it was the 25th of October before we got a, a response. Um, this time last year, Chair, um, the Southwest GP Federation were recruiting uh, for six uh, general practice nurse trainees and such was the uh, level of interest from those highly skilled and highly qualified graduate nurses that we had to spend three days interviewing to select six candidates who have all gone on to successfully complete their postgraduate certificate in general practice nursing at Ulster University. And some of them have gone on to further study to qualify themselves in the, the um, in spirometry and cervical screening. Chair, this proposal arose out of concerns for uh, resources, health, health professionals to work in primary care. And in the area of general practice nursing, our district council area is significantly under resourced. And this was an initiative which was designed to fill that gap. And it is extremely disappointing that we have highly skilled nurses out there who want to uh, progress a career in general practice nursing, and they are not being given the opportunity. We wrote in July with the hope and expectation that funding would be made available to allow uh, the next tranche of nurses to be trained. And unfortunately, that uh, um, appeal has fallen on deaf ears. A lot of comment has been made in this council regarding primary care services. We need multidisciplinary working. There is no reference uh, to the rollout of multidisciplinary teams in our council area. In fact, no reference in this letter to the work and support of GP federations. If we want to have proper provision of primary care services, we need personnel. We've already seen general practices close in our area. The minister really needs to ring fence and give priority to the provision of general practice personnel. And I would propose, Chair, that we write back requesting prioritisation of funding to address this very significant uh, workforce gap. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Deacon. Do you want to 
Councillor McAleer, are you happy enough to incorporate that in that we're not having proposals all over the place uh, in with your proposals? In Chair, I'm letter? more than happy. I'd just like to specify that in my particular case, it was in relation to clinical psychiatrists and mental health, the area that I was dealing with. But I'm absolutely happy to to include what Dr. Dehan has said, what Councillor Dehan has suggested there. Yeah. Councillor Dehan, are you happy enough that that's incorporated as well? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, will he, uh, you will you second the original uh, noting of the correspondence, and uh, second then uh, Emma's proposal as well. Just put a hand up, Councillor Brigham, if you want. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm happy to second Councillor McAleer's proposal, Chair, yeah. and the noting. Second the noting of this correspondence. Thank you. Okay, everybody happy with that? We'll move on to item eight point two, uh, which is to consider details of Northern Ireland Economic Conference to be held on the eighth of December uh, at Gallagorm Resort and Spa. Uh, it's online as well. Uh, so over to. Over to John again. Yes, Chair, it is. It is just notification of the of the conference and uh, from members uh, to book online. So give them a hand. Okay. Is there anybody expressing any uh, interest to go to that, Councillor Curry? Just to propose the note. Okay. Could I have a seconder for that, please? Uh, Councillor Feely, okay. Everybody happy with that? Thank you. Move on to item 8.3, and that is to consider email correspondence dated the 5th of November from Cornelia Dagelia, and I probably didn't pronounce that right, I apologise. Uh, 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 and uh, I'll just pass over to John. Yes. Uh... Thank you, Chair. Yes, correspondent from Conrad and Gilliga. Uh, in relation to Shopton and Gilliga week, um, and uh, a request uh, for the council to engage with the elected representatives and, and the Irish speaking community uh, to promote Shopton and Gilliga, uh, and also to provide specific fund to local Irish language community groups to support them in organising their events. Um, this is something that we do as a matter of course in uh, our Irish language action plan. Um, so, Chair, I, I think it is it is for noting um, because we already already undertaken actions. Councillor Curry, Your Mother clearly, yeah, I'm happy to propose an open of this letter and just to to put on record that thanks to Conor and Gilligan for their ongoing work and promotion of the Irish language, and thanks to our officers too in the council who are doing actually great work. Um, a couple of years ago now, I had proposed that we um, have. Um, bigger launch events for Shack and Gaelic in both ends of the district um, and COVID kind of hampered um, our plans for that. Uh, I know we're, we're kind of in, in territory at the minute where we don't really know what's going to happen, but can I just make sure that um, we are kind of, the intention is there um, because although we have had launch events in the past, they have been quite low key affairs and um, really aimed at, at the um, classes, the council run classes and targeting that audience. And the, the original proposal was really about broadening that out um, to a much wider audience and people who may not just be engaging with the classes, but still maybe have a wealth of, of Irish language knowledge or members of the Irish language community or people who just have a passing interest or would like to know a little bit more. So. It's just to make sure that that's still um, kind of there, that we're still working towards that, and we'd hope that we would be doing um, those bigger launch events now um, for this Shatnagiliga coming up this year, because as it points out there, it's 120 years this year. Um, it's a big celebration, and, and that's the sort of thing we're, we're kind of looking, looking for here. So just to um, remind, remind officers of that, really. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Jerry, yes. I suppose we have to take everything in, in, in light of what is happening with COVID at, at the time, you know, and, and see where we are at that stage. But yes, certainly it is. Uh, we'll see what happens in, in March. Okay, we've heard of proposed will be a seconder uh, for that. Councillor Tommy Maguire. Briefly, Siobhan. Yeah, well, it's just, it. I appreciate you know, we do have to um, keep an eye on, on COVID and where we are, but there is a bit of an element of preparation that's needed and maybe if there were expressions of interest around the different organizations or groups kind of you know hoping that we're going to be able to do it but if not good good homework to have done anyway for future years you know so the likes of Cultus um different maybe um uh performing arts groups different family groups for organizations all sorts of things you know if we can if we can kind of get that homework done we'd need to be doing it sooner rather than later march not be long coming around from okay so it's been proposed and seconded uh everybody happy with that okay we'll move on to item 8.4 and that's to consider the Northern Ireland Office High Street Task Force call for evidence. E Chair, so this uh, call for evidence paper was issued to all members on the 4th of November just to inform you of the upcoming workshops, of which there was one in Enniskillen on the 17th of November. There are further workshops, including an, uh, an online workshop, and um, also there's uh, a deadline for submission of evidence, which I think is the 6th of December. So this is really just to seek approval uh, to bring a consultation response to the special council meeting on the 2nd of December related to the call for evidence for members consideration and agreement. Okay. Uh, can I propose proposer please for that? Councillor Tommy Maguire, can I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong, you just coming in the second. Thank you. Everybody happy with that? Okay, move on to 8.5 and that's to consider correspondence dated the 5th of November from the Planning Appeals Commission regarding independent examination for Mana and Oma District Council Local Development Plan 2030 Plan Strategy. Thank you, Chair. And again, this correspondence is from the Planning Appeals Commission and is just uh, confirming to us that the uh, independent examination of the local development plan strategy will begin uh, in public hearing sessions at 10.30 a.m. on the 18th of January for a two-week period and uh, will be streamed live to YouTube. Uh, there is a program of hearing sessions and the guidance notes have also been attached to this correspondence and it's, it's for noting, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. It's proposed to note, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a seconder for that, please? Councillor Barry McIlduff, thank you. Is there any other correspondence? Chair, there, there is one other item, but maybe if we could take it on the matters arising from the last... Uh, Okay. Yes, committee meeting that would be good. That's fine. Okay, that is the end of the correspondence. We'll now move on to uh, matters arising from our uh, meeting on the 12th of October. And we will start with page one, page two, page three, page four. Page five, page six. John? Yes, uh, Chair, just um, in, in relation to the representation from the Consumer Council uh, at item 8.6 on the agenda, the response from the Consumer Council in, in relation to the request for information on food price increases for daily essentials is included. Um, they have given a very comprehensive response in, in relation to the price increases that the price on on of the price increases on 
on low income households, um, the increased impact on, on consumers in, in this area compared uh, to the rest of the UK. And indeed, they've listed a number of initiatives that the Consumer Council are leading on in, in relation uh, to lobbying for um, and, and to find out greater information on, on price increases. Okay, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, there was, I think, a proposal from Councillor Keenan that second, I seconded in relation to getting this response and probably highlighting a lot of what we already know. But the fact that the, the total grocery shop from October 2018 to October 21 has increased by 4% and the, the breakdown of the increases that are included in this letter, the fact that low-income households uh, would need to expend approximately a third of their take-home income to buy the minimum essential food basket uh, is quite, quite disturbing. Um, the reality that we, when when household budgets come on their screen, it's normally the food budget that's cut first and that indeed the healthier foods are the ones that are sacrificed or that parents do without to provide for their children in order to pay for other essentials such as home heating and we're well aware of the, the way uh, energy and, and home heating fuels are, are rapidly increasing as well. It's noted as well that we have the lowest levels of disposable income here, um, uh, right? not just within the UK, but within the North, we would have fairly low levels of income um, given the, the different sectors that are, that are uh, uh, available for employment here. We have more consumers with a disability or long-term sickness who rely on government support and more consumers who are economically inactive. Um, in relation to the, the, the support provided by the Consumer Council, they have noted that they have a leaflet there uh, to ways to make your money go further and to last longer, which they've uh, offered to the Council. And I would suggest that we do request hard copies of that, that we could stock uh, both in Oma and Enniskillen um, for our local residents, because no doubt there will be helpful hints and tips within that. Um, they also mentioned guidelines on safer ways to borrow money um, and the, the virtual workshops and in-person sessions that they offer. And I would like to propose that as well as stocking the, the hard leaflets that they talk about, that we would through our council uh, social media and if we can do it when it comes around to the, the issue of the info magazine as well, that we would maybe make reference to those various avenues uh, because the Consumer Council is a, a very good organisation. It's one that's very supportive and very useful to many people. And I think it's one that given the, the financial hardships that many people find themselves in, the ongoing price hikes of food, essentials, heating, electricity, that is something that unfortunately more and more people are going to need to, to become aware of. So I would be pro uh, proposing that we uh, follow up with them in relation to the proposals that they've made there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Are you happy enough to... Sorry, yeah. I'll hand it over to John first. Yeah, Chair, Chair just on, on the back of their correspondence, I actually have written back to the Consumer Council asking for copies of the leaflets that were provided with them. You will note also, too, that they, they mention one of the, the research projects which, which they are doing to compare the cost and availability of food items across different settlement sites, different food retail outlets and different geographic areas. And I have asked that they would consider our district as one of those geographic areas where they would do their research so that we would get very local data compared to other other places in, in, in the region in relation to it. So. Um, the correspondence just came in yesterday and I've, I've, I've written back to them today just requesting those items. Are you happy enough with that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Happy enough with that and I think you were going to say about noting the letter so I'm happy enough to propose the note in the letter as well. Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Deacon. Thank you, Chair. Well, I too would like to uh, commend the work uh, done by the Consumer Council but the contents of this letter are very concerning and I think, uh, you know, as a housewife, um, I have been very concerned about the uh, escalating costs of the uh, weekly uh, food basket. And unfortunately, um, uh, when finances are restricted, it is, as this letter indicates, uh, the food budget, which usually takes a hit. And, uh, you know, reflecting on the health inequalities report and the very poor life expectancies that exist uh, within our district council area, high levels of obesity, high levels of 
coronary heart disease. Uh, it is important that um, our citizens are able to avail of a healthy diet. But unfortunately, we know that f fresh produce, fruit and vegetables, very expensive and uh, not affordable by many families. And that uh, is not an acceptable fact. And it's something that we as a council need to address. And um, uh, members will be aware of the action planning workshop uh, for the OMA area, which was held yesterday, uh, uh, looking at health and well-being of our communities and particularly issues for people who are living with uh, multiple uh, morbidities. But diet is a really, really important factor in one's health and uh, uh, our life expectancy. And uh, when people use a lot of processed food, it puts them at risk of obesity and other uh, um, diseases, particularly uh, coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease and certain cancers. So this really is uh, of huge concern to us. And I know that our, uh, as part of the action planning workshop, we're to come back with ideas as to how we might address address this. Uh, and certainly I would be in favour of initiatives throughout the district whereby people would be educated in how to grow their own uh, uh, vegetables and fruits. And I know we have a, a number of allotment schemes within the district, and I, I feel that these uh, could be used to great advantage uh, to our local communities. But very concerning, uh, Chair, and I think it's something that we need to take action on. Thank you. Are you happy enough to second the note of the letter, Councillor Dehan? Yes, Chair, I will second it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barry McElduff. That's wonderful. Um, today at the Community Planning uh, Partnership Board, uh, we discussed uh, various issues to do with poverty. So I'd like to thank those within the wider community partnership who are leading on the poverty aspect of things and our own environmental health department, our own council are playing a key role. Um, today we heard highlighted, uh, just to broaden it slightly, um, for example, an oil buy-in scheme. Uh, families, uh, if, for example, I think it's as many as 60 uh, families or homes in a community came together, then the housing executive might work with a group of such a nature to achieve the best possible price for oil at this time in a collective way. So, you know, that's worthy of testing out and maybe our uh, community services people could be encouraged to take a specific look at that throughout our council area. But can I make a, a proposal that uh, we write to the executive office and Department for Economy as well um, in the way that a spend local scheme has been developed, you know, not without its problems, but, uh, you know, useful uh, of its own volition, helping people. But can we propose that the, the executive and the Department for Economy work urgently towards a help towards energy cost scheme? And uh, everybody knows that as well as the price of food, um, Electric, gas, oil, etc. Our uh, prices are, are sky high at the minute, uh, challenging everybody. And uh, can you imagine, you know, the people on lowest income, uh, how uh, they would get through the winter, for example? And I think there is noises coming from the executive uh, along these lines. But I think as a council, we should write to them and encourage them to move speedily, to move urgently and decisively and establishing such a scheme that will be of benefit uh, to people and will help them get through the winter. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Catherine Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yesterday, I uh, took a training course with Fermanagh Oma District Council and the Western Health Board on uh, slow cooker usage uh, uh, and got certified to bring that back into community groups uh, in order to help 
uh, low income families um, get slow cookers ingredients and uh, uh, nutrition advice and also how to use slow cooker. Um, I don't know if Councillor uh, Dehan or Michael Duff are aware of these programs, but I, it would be good if they could bring them back to the groups they just discussed uh, as ideas uh, for that group. And John, I'm wondering if there's any way a, a program that like that can be extended or or um, or more slow cookers or more participants take the training. Uh, to bring it back into our own communities in order to help these families that we're discussing. Chair, yes, just in, in relation to that query, we, we did actually approve, it was last month, we, we approved actually an extension of the slow cooker scheme, um, as we did for, for this winter. Um, so there is additional monies being placed into the slow cooker scheme and to be able to extend it and indeed to be able to extend the training, which you actually took place in, in yesterday. So it is something that we are actively involved in. Um, and in fact, the, the, the take up of the, of the, the slow cooker scheme um, is actually flattening out at this point in time. So it is something that, that we are actively trying to get out there into community. So I would encourage all members to, to, to promote it as far as possible. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Councillor McAleer, you've already been in. I'll let Councillor Corey enforced. Well, Cowley, I think there was a proposal there from Corey and Michael Duff, um, just around um, writing to the executive um, or the Department for Economy. I think I, I think I heard today that they'd actually returned something like forty six million pound. Um, so maybe that could be redirected. I know that uh, party colleagues there have been calling. Um, I know that um, the finance minister has written to the British Treasury urging a VAT reduction uh, on energy bills and uh, our party colleagues in the 26 counties have been doing that too. Um, there has also been contact looking for a windfall tax on generators. Um, they are seeing increased profits as a result of rising prices. Um, those could be redirected uh, towards fuel payment support. So just to support that proposal by Corlear Michael Duff, formally second it um, and just ask um, the rest of the executive, I suppose, um, particularly aimed at the economy minister, just to... to um, help people out, uh, you know, this isn't a blip now. Uh, what's happening with energy costs is not a blip. This is a big thing facing our community. It's it's actually affecting all of us. So um, those who are struggling the most are going to have a long, hard winter ahead. So um, I think it's a worthwhile thing to be raising that with the executive. Come on, you, Councillor McAleer, briefly, please. Chair, so in relation to the, the third resolution on the page, so if there's any other comments just on this issue, I'm happy enough to stall until then. Councillor Bert Wilson. Councillor Wilson, are you there? I'll come back to you, Councillor Wilson. Okay, Bert, I'll come back to you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, this is in relation to the, the issue uh, surrounding the, the free school meals grant and the, the school uniform grant. And uh, I know there's correspondence attached. And, and similarly, I have uh, eventually received correspondence myself for, from the, the Education Authority in relation to this issue. Um, noted within the correspondence, I think it, it similarly, the, the two are quite similar in, in the one that the council received, the one that I've received um, individually. The, the Director of Operations and Estates at the Education Authority asserts that 
the all applications are being processed within four weeks of receipt. Now, that's not the experience of some families in the OMA area. Now, I'm sure it's, it's not isolated to OMA, but that isn't what has been experienced. And I think the financial hardships incurred as a result of that are, are definitely being downplayed in both letters, in my mind. Um, the, the, the fact that it's stated that children in the receipt of a free school meals are provided with a meal in school, not a grant to cover the cost. Uh, first of all, issues that were raised with me were that the grant was, uh, wasn't actually covering the cost of a full meal. It was assigned a monetary value by the school and that then um, this may not necessarily equate to uh, a full school meal. So I think if, there, if there's any possibility maybe of following this up with the local schools, I would propose that we do that. Um, I suppose particularly the, the secondary schools in the Oak area was where I had been, uh, where issues have been raised with me, but I'm happy enough to extend that if, if other councillors deem it necessary, um, just to ensure the children are getting what they're entitled to, a full and nutritious, nutritious meal. The EA, has, a quote there, the EA has no legislative route to backdate claims for free school meals. Unfortunately, this isn't good enough for all those families who've been waiting for six or seven or more weeks on these grants. So I would actually be proposing that we go back to the EA and to the Minister or the Department for Education and to the Department of Finance to investigate who, the, who, who this can be redressed with for this year and indeed who it can be protected with for future years because that expense for one or more children on families over that period who have uh, submitted their applications is, is an unnecessary expense and it's an unaffordable expense given the climate that we're currently living on. The, the fact that the school uniform grant is a payment to contribute towards the cost of a uniform and not expected to cover the full cost of a uniform is again something that I think we should be looking at where we can. This is something that is noted is, is the, the particular to the schools themselves. But I think we need to uh, redress this with the EA, the department and the schools because the enforced expense on families, many of whom are struggling at this time, has to be acknowledged and no child should be forced to suffer through a lack of financial means. So I would like to maybe just follow up and propose that we follow up in relation to both the school uniform grant uh, and the, the meals grant with the department and with the, the schools and with the EA to see really what can be done about the, the in expense that's incurred by families. How can that be, uh, how can that be retrieved really? and to see going forward how this can be protected against the deeds. People here are waiting six or seven weeks for grants to be processed, that that doesn't happen again next year. Thank you, Chair. Okay, before we continue yeah. on on that. Yeah, wait. Chair, I think, I think I have been uh, muted or yeah. unmuted. You're unmuted, you're unmuted. Okay, Mr. Chair. Mr. Well, just as usual, I would like to raise the uh, a matter of the uh, agricultural industry and uh, the stress that they are under at this moment in time. Uh, their inputs are costing, an, there's an increase of somewhere 60%, some of it in fact over 100%. Bert, Bert, uh, Bert yes. stop there please, it's not related to this particular... Uh, maybe not, maybe not, but it was the, the welfare of the, uh, the, the, uh, the people, the, understood I was really worried about at this minute in time uh, and uh, they have long on sociable hours seven days a week and uh, their animals and their stock uh, they are really worried about them and their uh, they it has a, a, a really stressful time for the, those families as well I, I, I can understand yes what you're saying but uh, at the same time, there is uh, nothing been done about it, or nobody seems to uh, really care. Well, obviously, the place to discuss this, Councillor Wilson, is the Agriculture Relations Group. So, yeah, uh, well, we did that, but it's there, nothing happens. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, I'll pass over to John uh, first. No, Chair, um, I think we, we have the correspondence uh, from the Education Authority. I think we need a proposer and, and seconder to note it. And then I think there are maybe two separate proposals uh, from Councillor McAleer, one to follow up with the with the local schools to, to ensure that the, or to query whether the cost 
uh, provided by the Education Authority does cover a full hot nutritional meal, and the second one to go back back to the to the Education Authority and the Department of Finance um, with a number of queries. All all I suppose all need to be seconded, and the first one, in fact, to note needs to okay, be. Okay, I'm going to bring Professor Deacon in first, and she might second them first, Professor Deacon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, indeed, I will uh, uh, second uh, the noting of the correspondence and the uh, uh, proposals made by Councillor McAleer. And I too want to express my concern uh, regarding um, families being disadvantaged uh, through not having uh, their application for free meals, free school meals in on time uh, before the deadline. Uh, and the Education Authority uh, um, was not generous in extending that deadline. I think that m many families who were in receipt of a free school meal grant uh, fully expected that that uh, eligibility would continue into the present school year. That proved not to be the case. Uh, and so uh, uh, families missed out. And then, as Councillor McAleer has alluded to, uh, the processing of the free uh, school meals application uh, takes a long time. And uh, the Education Authority uh, have declined to backdate payments uh, for free school meals. And this creates a lot of financial hardships uh, uh, for families. And I think the children are really missing out here. And it's really you know, I, I just uh, I have the impression that there is not a can do attitude within the education authority, and that's very regrettable. And it's also very difficult to understand because surely the education authority has a vested interest in providing for the needs of children and families. Uh, also, the fact that these applications are made online with difficulties in, in uh, uploading necessary documentation to prove eligibility for free school meals. This is all very difficult for families. And so I think there has to be a recognition of that by the Education Authority. And they have to go some way to accommodate the needs of families and, and children. So I just wanted to make that point and, and to second uh, Councillor McAleer's proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dehan. Uh, I don't think the, the original noting of the letter was proposed. Uh, can I have um, somebody to propose that, please? Councillor Michael Duff's coming in. Do yep. you want to propose it? Happy to propose that, Chair. And just to say that I think the Education Authority's commitment to dialogue with this Council is lukewarm at best. Uh, we had a scheduled meeting with the Education Authority this month, and it has been postponed to January. I think if they could postpone it to March after that, and then May after that, and maybe on into September and October, there's a real lukewarm uh, attitude on the part of the EA to meeting with this council when we have in place an agreement to meet twice a year. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think they're avoiding, avoiding contact with this council in that way. Thank you, Chair. But I'm happy to propose the noting of the letter. Councillor Deacon, you had uh, seconded the the noting of the correspondence. Are you happy enough to uh, remain there? Pat? Yes, absolutely, Chair. Thank you. I thought, in fact, I had proposed the noting of the correspondence, but um, happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on then on that was page six, page seven. Page eight, page nine, pass over to Kim. Okay, thank you, Chair. So one, just in reference to item 5.3 and the update report on the broadband working group, um, I wish to seek approval to reschedule the broadband work group meeting, uh, which is to take place on the 30th of November, to a date in mid-December, which uh, we, we yet need to just finalise that date. Uh, this is to facilitate attendance by Department for Economy and Fibrous officials so that they can update us on the progress to 
expansion of the pro project stratum. Um, just to note that I've, I've agreed this, if the members are content, I've agreed this with the chair of the Broadband Working Group. Uh, the, the chair has also asked if we could facilitate a morning meeting on this occasion, if possible. Okay, you've heard that, uh, could I have a proposer uh, that we go down that road? Mr. McAleer. There's a member I'd have to say a morning meeting wouldn't actually suit me, so whilst I'd be happy enough to uh, postpone it in order to have the representatives of the groups mentioned, I, I wouldn't be happy enough to move it to a morning. I'd like to keep it at the, the standard time, so that would be my proposal, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. I was proposed to go with the title of this date proposed by Kim. Okay. Councillor Gunn. Thank you, Chair. Just like the second Councillor McAleer's proposal there, just because it was moved to that time to facilitate people uh, attending. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, we've had a proposal from Councillor McAleer, second to be Councillor Gannon, that we remain at the 4, 4 uh, p.m. Uh, and is are both happy, Councillor McAleer and Councillor Gannon, at moving the date then um, to that? Um, Councillor Robinson, there's been nobody has seconded your proposal uh, that we put it in, in the, change the date, but put it in the morning meeting. So I'm going to put Councillor Gannon or Councillor McAleer and Councillor Gannon's proposal to the the uh, committee. Uh, everybody happy with that? Okay, that's passed. We we'll move on to paper page ten. Councillor Feely. Sorry, I, I, I thought about. So I was going to ask what 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 was the date was because I think we'd want it fairly quickly because I have a few. I don't want to bring it up here tonight, but I have a few issues with fibres and the bro and the broadband at the minute. So it, it, fairly quick, if we could, Kim. We all have page ten, page eleven, page twelve. Sorry, pa Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yes, in relation to eight point one, the top of. Page 11, um, and I tried to raise this on the night, but wasn't allowed. But hopefully, I can raise it now. Um, the issues highlighted, I suppose, by Mid Ulster Council related solely to the visual impact or the impact on the visual landscape and the increased volume of traffic. I would propose that as a council, we contact them and go back to them on this and ask them do they have any concerns or have they taken on board or investigated the negative impact that toxic mining has on water, on air, on land, and on health as part of their. Uh, submission or response to the planning application. So I'd just like to make that as a proposal this evening, Chair. Thank you. As I understand it, Chair, that recommendation that Ulster have already agreed uh, through their committee and, and taken a decision on their uh, response to the application. That has, that has been submitted by Mid Ulster. Do you want to respond to that, Councillor McAleer? Yeah, Chair, the, the planning application, to the best of my knowledge, is still open. So um, I would just like to proceed with that because obviously they can update and amend their response as long as the plan application is live. So I would, yeah, I would still like to proceed with that as a proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, have we a seconder for that? Okay, sorry, we have no seconder for that. So that uh, proposal falls. Um, that was page 11. 
page 12, page 13, punch mark layer. Sorry, Jeremy, my light seems to have been left on since the break. Okay. Page 14. And that was it. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And it's really just in, t in respect of the uh, multi-agency meeting regarding uh, traffic congestion at St Connor's School. Do we have an update on that, please? Yes, uh, Chair. Uh, there is a there is a date in the diary, I believe, uh, in relation to that. Now, I don't know when exactly it is, but uh, but I mean, certainly there is a there is a date for for the multi-agency meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That is the end of the matter to rising. We will go back to uh, item number nine, which is any urgent and relevant business. Certainly, I haven't received any uh, notification of any apart from Kim, and so I'll pass over to Kim. Thank you, Chair. So, really, this is just to seek a retrospective approval from members to reschedule the scheduled meeting of the Brexit Committee on the 20th of December. Uh, to the earlier date of the thirtieth of November, just to the proximate, just due to the proximity to the, the Christmas holidays and the Christmas break, that has been agreed in liaison with the committee chair and the agenda that we issued today. Okay, can I have a proposal that we, uh, Councillor Feely, and a seconder, please, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Thank you. Okay. That is the end of that. Uh, can I have a proposer, please, now to go into committee? Councillor Corey, seconded by Councillor Feely. Um, I'll pass over to John to sum it up. Thank you, Chair. Um, while in committee, members consider the confidential minutes of the regeneration and community meeting uh, dated the 12th of October. Uh, no matters arising. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, that is the end of the meeting. Um, we can I have, sorry, can I have a proposal first of all uh, on that, on the summing up? Councillor Curry and Councillor Gannon. Hands up everywhere here. Then I would have wanted a hand earlier on, I couldn't get one. Um, okay, that is the end of the meeting. Thank you everybody for your participation. That is a, a five. A good Five and a quarter hour meeting we've had if you had the last night on it as well. Uh, I talked to the relevant department about getting a raise. <laughs>